Right. So, um, hi, um, Brandon and Bill, thank you so much for being here and welcome to the inclusive group work. How do we foster teamwork among diverse um, identities? So uh, a survey by the Association for American Colleges um, and University found that only 39% of employer rates our graduate as very well prepared for teamwork and 38% for intercultural skill. Um, so basically, employers feel that undergraduate program don't adequately prepare students for teamwork and, and intercultural skill, interpersonal skill. So the accreditation board for engineer and technology, uh, ABET, to res um, respond to this by requiring engineering program to demonstrate that their graduate have an ability to function a multidisciplinary team. So I think it's unique for engineering. I don't know if um, College of Education or biology require that in your curriculum, you have to demonstrate that your student, um, your graduate have the ability to function in multidisciplinary team. Um, so that's something that you might want to have a conversation with your department. So um, not just for engineering or STEM field, and Many other professionals demand that our graduate work in team and in general student learn and 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 retain um, information better when they they work um, in team rather than just lecture or, or other instructional format. Um, so today we will explore some of the ideas about fostering teamwork through inclusive high quality group assignments. And um, at the end of the presentation, I have a slide with all the um, um, empirical research that I used to, to produce this workshop. So um, my name is Lynn Nguyen, I taught chemistry. I'm a, I like to tell people I'm a recovering chemistry professor. Um, so I taught at different university and I've been at NIU since 2016. Um, and last year, that's when I moved to faculty development as um, an inclusive teaching coordinator. So um, although I'm new to the faculty development field, but I have over a decade of teaching um, in higher education. So um, I'm super excited to have the opportunity to discuss with you what high quality group assignment and what they can do to foster interpersonal skill for our student and to better prepare them for the real world team oriented workplace. Um, so uh, Brendan, I know we chat and at length about what you do and um, thank you so much for all the work that you do. But Bill, do you, have you met Brendan? Have you guys met each other? So let's do a really quick introduction so that you two can learn about each other. Do you want to go first, Bill? Sure. Um, I'm over in biology. Uh, nice to meet you, Brendan. Um, so um, one of my biggest concerns is in STEM that uh, the discipline, despite kind of national calls for diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, the entire discipline is getting uh, wider and wider. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with the white people, I'm not saying that. Um, it's more about how do we reach out to different communities and make this uh, really, um, again, based off of not only engineering, but many other disciplines have said that uh, you make better decisions when there's more diversity at the table. Um, the diversity can be um, gender, race, ethnicity, um, demographics of all sorts. So um, how do we stem the tide? Um, how do we change the pattern of uh, diversity over in the STEM fields? And so um, I'm actively doing some research in this discipline. And so this one really caught my eye as something I wanted to get into. So. Cool. Uh, I'm Brandon. I So I'm an assistant professor in the College of Ed um, in special education. Uh, my my background, kind of my educational background is all in psychology. Um, so my kind of field of study is um, applied behavior analysis. And uh, we, I mean, just depending on what university you're at, usually the behavior analysis area is either in education or it's in psychology. And so at NIU, it was the, the program was started in the College of Ed. Um, I teach quite a few courses for the master's program here online. And so I'm always kind of looking for ways to 
kind of improve my teaching, especially related to group work and group activities um, in an online kind of Zoom format. And um, as far as my education kind of undergrad classes go, um, I think the, the reality is so, so much of real life teaching is, is working in groups, right? Whether it's, um, you know, working with the par paraprofessional that's in your class or working with the, the IEP team when you have a student with a significant disability. Um, and I think, you know, I'm always looking for ways to improve just collaboration with, with other colleagues. Yeah, thank you. And I recognize both of your name. I saw Bill in person. I haven't met you in person, Brendan, but I know that you both champion for um, diversity, equity, and excellence. I started adding the word excellent because equity doesn't mean you have to compromise um, academic vigor, right? You can demand excellent of a student at the same time, provide them the, the tools, the support that they need to success um to to succeed in your course so thank you so much for being here um and hopefully one day you two can uh, bump into each other at a phase or one of the workshop and teaching practices so uh, these are um a few learning objectives that we're going to target today. Um, there's ample evidence that our collective intelligence, when we work together on teams, outperform even the highest achieving individual intelligence. And we learned that from the animal kingdom, from bees, ants, um, to elephant. And we see the powerful result when the collective intelligence of collective intelligence when the world come together to address the COVID-19 pandemic, right? There's so much information sharing, which is sharing. So um, as you know, um, the, the, the teamwork is very critical so that we can um, hone in on that collective intelligence. However, it takes intention and preparation to cultivate effective use of team and maximize collective intelligence. So today we're going to are focusing on how can we design a high quality um, team or group assignment and then carefully construct diverse team like Bill mentioned, um, when you bring more voices, more perspective, more experiences to the table, you tend to have a, a broader view of the issue and you have a better um, solution for that. So um, tell the team why they need to do what they what you ask them to do as team, explain to them why you want them to work on this project on team instead of individual. Um, and then um, explain to students that you trying to teach them interpersonal skill uh, because it's uh, essential to be successful in the future workforce. Um, and, and I'm gonna show you later on research on how individual who being attentive to other needs can increase group intelligence. So being thoughtful is a strength. Being kind is a strength, not a weakness. And students should value team members who have good um, social perceptiveness. Um, and finally, we're going to talk a little bit about how to equitably assess um, t student team. Um, and I have, um, as CIDO, we have a separate workshop on equitable grading practices. So um, check out our um, upcoming program if you're interested in learning more about equitable grading. So the first learning objective, um, effective student teamwork rely heavily on well thought out team assignment. Um, study have showed that poor student behavior during teamwork is often a result of inadequate assignment um, and not so much problematic group dynamics. So to ensure successful teamwork, team assignment should serve a clear purpose um, that they align with your course learning objective and the course goal. Um, the grading criteria should also be aligned with the course learning objective and course goal. And then you, the team assignment should require individual accountability, but at the same time, foster inter, um, in, interdependent positive interdependence. So they need to work together, but at the same time, you have to have a way to hold individual accountable. It's, it's a daunting task. It's challenging to have a good um, group assignment. So um, this is an example 
um, and I use STEM because I've seen it um, throughout my undergraduate um, years. So an assignment, um, the faculty who's learned that, okay, teamwork is good, so let's do it. But then they didn't know how to do it um, at first. So you can see an assignment like this. As a team, we showed the impact of the 2010 Gulf oils um, spill on the environment and then prepare a 10 page written report and present your finding to the class. And then they decide either like two students, three or a group of five, four. So when you see a group assignment like this, what jump out to you? Is it a high quality group assignment? Um, how can you make it better? What would you do? Um, I think one thing that strikes me is just what are the individual contributions for each for each student. Um, so just a, a permanent product of ten pages doesn't really uh, demonstrate how group activity is is to be at play here. Um, this looks like an individual assignment to me. Okay. Thank you. How about you, Bill? Anything else that jump out at you? Yeah, for me, it's very big. Like, what's your goal? Um, you know. If if you, you could drill down to give specific examples of categories of impact, um, you know, you can take impact on the environment in any different way, but depending on the individual class, you can tailor this. Um, again, I think what Brandon said is you break it down. Um, this looks like a single assignment to me, um, but you can have students break down different perspectives within it and then tie them together. Um, and so I think with them, just a couple more sentences, you can really flush this one out so it's solid. Yeah. So I I went to college 20 years ago. Um, that's, that's my team assignment would look like this. And it would require the um, student who know how to navigate the system would say, okay, we need to go to office hour and ask the professor exactly <laughs> what he wants. But it take, um, not everybody know that, right? So um, for first generation student, uh, or for, for me, I didn't know. It's we're lucky that I have um, a, a team a team member who know. And so we were able to track the professor down, get more information. But you both already know that you got to give them more, right? So, um, more instruction would be super helpful, right? So group assignment in the early term should include relatively simple but well-defined tasks that require specific products so student can concentrate on, on uh, the mechanics of teamwork and learn about one another. So for example, this problem, I would break it down as collectively your team should identify the important area to study, right? So you don't, you could give it to them as guidance or you could guide them to discover the different area of study that they want. So this task is very simple, but well-defined. So for example, um, uh, they can divide it the task. Maybe they can learn about the biological impact uh, on plant, fish, and, and then uh, impact on a shoreline. And then each team member should research um, a different area and then prepare a two-page overview and then describe their finding to the rest of the team. Um, so um, this allows you to, um, this good first time tasks may require the team to collaborate, um, complete a list of area of study and reflect on the team interaction too. Because don't forget that we're trying to teach them interpersonal skill too. So this allow you, the professor, to award points based on how well the student work as individual and together as a team to accomplish a consensus list of area that they're gonna do more research and study. So as the team progress, um, as um, the instructor, you should assign more complex and ambitious tasks like this to promote higher level of thinking um, in a more complex state of team project, um, define individual versus team accountability. So for example, um, in this case, each team member should conduct research 
on a consensus area of study for the oil spill. And then they should report back to the team. And then collectively, they have to write a cohesive introduction and summary, and then put together a presentation that describes the overall impact of the 2010 Gulf oil spill on the environment, the economy, and public um, policy that come out of that. Um, now, the last thing is um, grading, right? So you, the team will be graded on both the written report and the presentation, and individual score will be adjusted based on the quality of the two-page research overview that they have to do individually in the beginning. Um, uh, when they try to come up with the list of area to study. So um, one thing I would suggest is consider randomly calling on any team member to present a final report during a class presentation. This practice foster individual accountability and positive interdependence. So you see throughout this team project, they have to work on something individually, and then they have to come together and produce a consensus list of area of study. And then after that, they have to break down and then they have to do more uh, individual work and then they come together. But then by the end uh, with the presentation, everybody should be able to present the whole presentation to the group. So that is um, an example of a, a, a good team assignment. Um, now, um, I'm going to stop here and um, ask, what did you think about that example? And uh, what does your group assignment look like in your discipline? I guess I can go first. Um, yeah. I found, I've, yeah, I thank you so much for sharing that, uh, you know, group assignment uh, details about the oil spill. Um, one challenge that I've found in the past is that the random, the stress associated with random assignment of a presentation uh, sends some students through the roof. Um, and so for me, I simply say, you know, you have 15 minutes, everybody gets five, um, get it done. Um, and so within the presentation, I would also encourage breaking that down with a rubric saying, you know, introduction summary, you know, however you want to do it, but um, everybody has to speak for five minutes um, and there'll be a timer going. Um, and so, you know, please divide the content up. Um, however you want to present it is up to you, but everybody's got to get up there. Um, I've found that the random assignment is too stressful. Um, and yeah. And yeah. also it breeds a little bit of animosity in the group if there's any tensions already building. Um, students do not want their grade to pinge on somebody else. Uh, and so uh, just unhooking the students slightly from each other, um, I found is actually a little bit less stressful. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I can go into my own discipline if you want. Yeah. Um, and Bill, do you doing research on this area, right? Like, do yeah. you do, do you like do qualitative analysis and, and, and write up? So the, the suggestion that I just, um, said, um, encouraged to random that was based on a study and that study is fairly old but I really yeah. like your method right because you everything you just said is right um, when you distribute and everybody know that they will have to be PP and they will um, have to learn about public speaking so that's great um, yeah it, it, um, the methodology came more from best practices of uh, university assessment and so the university assessment wanted data on individual students presentations and actually um, it came to be favor favored by the students um, you know they gave feedback on it so uh, I think this came out of the English departments uh, a former institution essentially these are the best practices for um, having composition and then oral presentation. Um, yeah. So um, again, we all learn from each other. And so I certainly can't uh, claim credit for the methodology, uh, but it's something that I've used and worked actually pretty well. Um, as long as you've got a, a solid rubric to echo off of um, and grade students on so they know, they know it's coming, then yeah, you, it's, um, it's, I found it work. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Um, Brandon, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I so uh, I think it differs in my my undergrad versus graduate classes. My undergrad classes, we tend to do, um, you know, in every class, I try to spend at least 
you know, 30 minutes towards the end of class after I've done the lecture and discussions where I just have them break into groups and kind of practice what we talked about. So like we might be talking about data collection practices in the classroom. So now they have to go like watch a video or find something where they can use the data collection we talked about and kind of demonstrate it. And the problems I find with that, I mean, typically I let them pick their own groups. Um, so with that, you kind of have the stronger students tend to group together, the weaker students tend to group together, and then you have the weaker students who are really struggling. Um, and so I've, I've, you know, and then, but then if you randomly assign the groups, they get upset, right? Because they want to work with their friends. You know, you have all these things that you have to balance. And, yeah. um, and then you're also thinking, okay, well, I want my teaching uh, evaluations to be good at the end of the semester. And, you know, th th there's a lot of layers here for, yeah. uh, for group work. But with my master's students, um, I uh, was kind of mentioning this earlier before you came in, Bill, but I do this, this model called interteach where uh, I break the students every class into randomly assigned uh, kind of study groups and they have to um, discuss their study guide that we they had to do before class. Um, and so that's it, it's, it's not necessarily like there's not a permanent product per se that the group comes together to do, um, but they are forced to be in groups and they're teaching each other. Um, and so then I come in and I'm able to like call on specific people and say, okay, what did you get from this particular question? Um, and then I can kind of have more in-depth discussions with each of the groups. Um, and that works really well. One, because it's random, you know, it's every time you're, you're in class, you're with a different group. Um, but it's, it's, uh, so I, I've been trying to think about how, how I can use something like that to make into a more formal project, um, rather than just kind of discussions. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I hope that you're both aware that um, Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning have a week of open classroom. So where we showcase the different classroom, um, typically from um, professor with teaching award. But at the same time, I sometimes just like come across something, some teaching practice that really great. And then I would um, encourage the faculty to join the open classroom um, so that you can showcase your practice to other people. Because I love everything that you just described. Um, 20 years ago when I were in college, it's were um, quite different. Um, but yeah, I would love to participate in your class. And we're gonna talk, we're gonna talk a little bit um, uh, more about constructing team and, um, and I would love to hear more from you too. So um, now that we have a team assignment or a team project that is complex enough that an individual would not be able to complete it by themselves, um, creating student team will work well um, is another critical aspect of using group assignment in, in your classroom. So uh, uh, some important thing to consider um, is regarding including the number in team. And like you say, it's, it's very challenging. Um, the level of diversity on student team uh, depend on your student population and whether um, the instructor gonna determine membership or sometimes um, you have to let them choose themselves or sometimes it's random. Um, there's an advantage and a disadvantage to each method, right? So it depends on your course, depend your student uh, and depend on what you want them to learn out of the class. You might have to mix, um, mix up and use all three different way. So, but basically um, the thing that, um, important consideration are smaller team are usually uh, better facilitate um, individual accountability and allow for more flexible scheduling when you if, if you require team to do outside of class activity on the other hand larger team they would have um, the potential for more resources um, more ideas and point of views to be brought to the problem so in general it's recommended that team of three to five student work best uh, with smaller team recommended for short-term project and simpler tasks and larger team for long-term and more complex um, project and assignment. Um, so when you construct team, how do we construct heterogeneous team carefully? And um, I hope you'll appreciate my <laughs> word choice here, it's heterogeneous instead of diversity. Because sometimes when people hear the word diversity, they freak out and uh, because like 
it's it's often narrowly view only in terms of gender and race uh, minority status um but i intentionally use a more technical term heterogeneous team to emphasize the strength of broad range of ability, backgrounds, experiences, and problem-solving perspective. So it doesn't have to be to narrowed out to gender and racial ethnic minority status. Um, so um, I'm a fan of Hidden Brain podcasts, and I, I recently checked out the episode called The Secret to Great Team, where a psychologist and professor Anita Woolley um, from Carnegie Mellon University were interviewed. And so one of the groundbreaking findings in her lifelong career on collective intelligence was having more women in the group raises collective intelligence. Now, she later do a whole lot more work, and so she had chain. So in the early stage of her career, she said collective intelligence were more strongly correlated with members' social sensitivity. Um, and proportionally of the female in the team than with the team member individual um, intelligence. She later do more research, of course, and so she um, carefully avoid the female proportion positive correlation with collective intelligence and emphasize on the social perception or social sense sensitivity and attentiveness. So basically, if you have team member who have a lot of social uh, atten attentiveness and social sensitivity, collective intelligence improve and teamwork result better um, solution. So there are a lot of evidence that when women or minority are outnumbered in team, the team participation can be negatively impact because their opinion may not be considered a valid by the teammate or they may be assigned an important task. So seeing I'm aware of this, I serve on a um, board director of local nonprofits. And I do notice that people just like default the woman to the secretary position. And I call them out every time. And I even call out the woman. And these women are highly educated. Many of them actually professor at NIU, serving on board director of local nonprofit. But people just default to ask them to serve as secretary. And I say, pause think. <laughs> so we all have that, um, but it's good to, to, to pause and think about this. Um, so yeah, if you uh, want to check out Hidden Brain, look up the secret to great team uh, and give it a try. It's, it's a really good podcast. So, um, so how do we construct team? What do you consider when you construct team? Um, do you consider practical and equitable issue? Um, so I have here, you could students self select randomly or instructor assign. And then I say there's advantage, disadvantage to anything, right? So I'm gonna stop here because um, I want to hear from you. And I still remember, Bill, you share something about what you did rotation with the lab. I, I like for you to share that um, if you can, because I think it's really good. Sure, absolutely. So this semester, um, again, for student success, um, targeting student success, one of the things that we actually, uh, in terms of the literature, is student connections um, and how they adapt, especially in first gen um, demographics uh, that are underrepresented in science. Um, and so that's quite broad and underrepresentation in science. Um, and so how do you increase uh, students' um, connections and their ability to learn from their peers? And so typically we have we have a captive audience literally every semester. Um, and it's great because uh, students have to walk into a lab and they typically randomly sit somewhere in the lab. And the person to your right or to your left is automatically your lab partner for the whole semester. Um, that can go very well or very poorly. <laughs> um, and students, unfortunately, are typically locked into that semester. Um, and so what I'm doing this semester is actually taking one half of the lab sections in two different courses, totaling 450 different students, and uh, shuffling one half of the labs. Um, so I'm asking them after four weeks uh, to get up 
um, find a new lab partner, sit down and start working. <laughs> um, and so there, the lab is built based on skills. Um, and so everybody's coming in with a uniform lack of knowledge. It's, it's uh, assumed that they know nothing. Um, and so um, simply by shuffling up the teams, what we're hoping to do is build more community. Uh, build more connections and um, eventually build a community of learners uh, that will um, help with retention. Um, and so I surveyed the students coming in. Uh, who do you know in the class? Um, surveying, I'll plan to su survey the students on their way out saying, who do you know in the class? Um, and simply give scores to the number of students that they have made connections to. Um, and uh, essentially what's been shown, at least in another study, um, with the different demographics, um, different university, um, that those connections actually helped with long-term retention, long-term success um, across their four years. So some of these minor little shifts um, could actually be huge. Um, you know, it doesn't matter to us as instructors, but it could mean the whole world to a student's uh, success. So. Um, in order to encourage other people to do this, somebody's got to be the guinea pig. And so um, we're jumping in and we're doing the research. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited. Um, we had our first shuffle here after four weeks and um, we'll shuffle again after eight weeks. And then really after 12 weeks, the semester's done. Um, and then we'll kind of collect our data. Um, and then we have permission from IRB to watch the students scores for at least three years. And what we're hoping to see is that their retention next fall is better um, if they were in a shuffled group. Um, so yeah, thank uh, you. I, I think then with that, then you know, it, it kind of cascades, right? So yeah, yeah. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, in many lab that I sit in, you stuck with the person who sit to your right, yeah. and that's it. So that's a really nice. And the two component here, so you use student self-select and randomly at the same time, right? Because if students oh. already know each other, they would come in and sit next to each other. But then um, there's a random component in there too. So I'm very intrigued and excited to see what the result that you're going to find after this um, this study. Um, how about you? For any results, <laughs> <laughs> Brandon. Uh, so I think in in my undergrad class, it's it's a little bit different. So in in special education, we have a cohort model. So all of our students, right? They, if if we were doing, let's say, group work in what we call kind of their pre-block or or their first block, many of them don't know each other at that point. But by the time they get to me, so I teach their last their last class in the program before they go on to student teaching. Um, which is kind of their behavior management class, and they all know each other by that point. Uh, so it's it's interesting, like a different, I, mean, I think a different format because they there might be these interpersonal problems, right? They've been with each other for two years now. Some of them don't like each other, right? So they don't sit next to each other. Um, but it's the reality, right? When you're thinking about being in the real world and and working in teams, right? There's always going to be somebody that you don't necessarily like, but you still have to have a good collegial connection with them, right? You have to be able to work with them. And so I've, you know, in my undergrad classes, I, I mentioned before, I have tended to let them select themselves, like the students, like uh, self-select into their groups. But like I mentioned, right, there's, all, all, there's almost always going to be Right. There's going to be really strong groups that that I don't have to worry about. Right. They're they they are going to do everything. On, they're going to be on task the whole time. They're going to get it done in, in five minutes. Right. When I've allotted 30 minutes. Um, and then you're going to have right those couple groups that that are, are really struggling. Right. That I'm going to they're going to go over the time limit because they're you know, they're they're taking too much time. Uh, so that's kind of those have been some of my issues. And I I haven't quite figured out how to make them uncomfortable with uh, with me assigning them right and then also i think i think it would also be very and this is where i've where i've kind of hit a barrier it would be very clear to them if i assigned them it's because i'm trying to put a strong student with a weak student and i don't want to send that message either you know um so that's where i'm trying to figure out how do i how do i do this so it's it's best for them but also um i don't know does that make sense yeah, I'm curious. Are the team work together just for the the um class time, or are they gonna work together outside of class as well? So it it could be both. I mean, I I'm talking mostly about during class time. That's when most of my group it's more group activities rather than group projects. Um, 
but it, it could right if, if if you know i i'm always looking for ways to do actual formal group projects too and in, in my courses but but no this was this would mainly be during class activities yeah so throughout the semester do do you shuffle with them i, don't, I haven't I so far agreement. i yeah. see yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. Um, maybe when Bill gets some results and share with <laughs> everyone, maybe it inspires you to try something uh, yeah. different. Yeah, and like I say, a lot of the time we can always find the advantage and disadvantage with everything. It depends on your your um student and what you want them to learn and how, how like you say the Bill probably have freshmen right or very early on in the lab where they don't know each other yet so shuffling have a benefit so that they can find who that who they can work really well with and who they need to stay away but for you it's different they already know each other so yeah there's a lot of nuances in there um there's a tool um called catme.org it's very intensive um as you it's you basically collect student data and then help you forming team based on your specific instruction. Um, these usually use for engineering um, classes where they have to demonstrate that the student learn how to work in team and have teamwork skill. Um, so, but it's interesting. Um, you should check out and take a look at it. Um, you can also develop your own survey if you're gonna have a one semester, like a long project for the whole semester and they have to work on it the whole semester. You might want to um, collect some data and people background experiences and different way of thinking and problem solving before you put them into a group. Um, and I'll give them the option to suffer around and change. So, um, Here's uh, something that I hope you consider these um, practical and equitable issues. So um, teamwork best when members of team have complementary skill. So maybe survey your student at the beginning of the semester and you that data to place them in team if they need to work on a project for an extended time um, outside the classroom. Um, excuse me. So in Anita Woolley's study, collective intelligence decreases when you place only one woman in in the team. So um, try to let's have a pair of minorities or a woman in the team um, if your team is more than two. Other things to consider are that member of team do not have conflicting evening schedule or for out of class activities. So I'm talking more about like when you have big team projects and they have to meet outside of class to do work together. Um, first year student after the pandemic, uh, now they typically live on campus, but um, we still have a significant portion of first year student commuting here at NIU. So they would be commuting from the Chicago area. So consider placing first year student who live off campus on the same team um, because um, often they empathize with one another situation when it comes to commuting or living on campus. So these are just some practical things to consider. Um, before the pandemic, one study suggested that placing students who live near each other on a team for ease of meeting. But right now, I mean, with various virtual meeting options, this practice may not be relevant these days. And last but not least, like you mentioned, Brandon, don't force students who don't want to work together to be on the same team. <laughs> research, empirical research showed that it's never work. So if you can find out those early on and make sure that they don't have to be forced on the same team it would be better for everyone um so um learning objective number three i'm gonna go through this um pretty quickly so um how do you teach your student teamwork or interpersonal skills through group assignment right so um there are four stages of um team teamwork or team evolution. The ability of team member to work effectively together can evolve over time um, as students acquire interpersonal skill. So I'm, I'm trying to have a very growth mindset, like anything that they don't have yet, 
they can learn and acquire, including interpersonal skill. But your job as a professor, you have to help them get there. So the four state of teamwork, including forming, storming, norming, and then performing. Um, so in the forming state, it characterized by orientation to the team um, and, and dependent on other why storming is uh, often mark conflicts and resistant to group influence. So usually there will be some conflicts and resistant. This resistance can be overcome in the norming state though. So during which um, the cohesiveness develop a new role as adopted and you will be the one who guide them through all of these stages. And finally, in the performing state, the team is focusing on the tasks and the tasks only. So structure can now become supportive of, of tasks performance. I think it's very important for you to tell your student that the team, like warn them, let them know that it's very likely that you're going to experience conflicts as they work together. Um, and for you, the professor, to provide students with way to deal with those conflicts. And again, this is particularly for long-term project. Um, so explain to your student not only do they need to learn practical skill for working in the team, but they also need to learn civics values. So including commitment to the common good, um, to the well-being of other team member, um, a sense of responsibility to contribute to one fair share of the work, and then respect for the effort of others and, and for them as people. Um, behaving with integrity, caring for team member, compassion when um, team member are in need and appreciation for diversity. So these are some example of civic values that um, for team to, to honor. And in the next slide, we discuss some strategy to um, have successful team experiences. So these are, um, something that I hope you consider devoting a portion of your first class at the beginning of the semester to do some team building activity or develop an um, initial assignment, asking team to reflect on the characteristic of success successful team, assuming that you, you intended to give them team project. Um, so having student complete a learning style questionnaire, um, and then reflects on the team result have been shown um, to increase student team skill. So consider creating simple script depicting common team dilemma, invite students to role play the situation, discuss challenges they have encountered, generate lists of strategy to, to resolve conflict. Um, those are some good strategy for having successful teamwork experience. Um, also invite students to, to think about the role they, they tend to play within teams. So if they tend to, um, to be the one who do more of the talking, um, invite them to think about that. Or if they're the one who tend to do more of the thinking and not sharing the thought, then invite them to think about that as well. So make a conscious effort to be mindful of other teammates. Um, so maybe invite the individual who aware and recognize that they tend to talk, invite them to take a step back and listen. And then invite individual who usually think and don't talk, invite them to take a step up and talk. Um, also ask students to be aware of how gender, cultural background, social economic status, and life experiences could affect the team member performance. Um, so um, like if you happen to have a walking parent in a group and her kid got sick and she might be delayed, just kind of teach them to be aware of the different um, things, life experience that the teammate have. Encourage students to assume that the team member are always doing their best and want the team to succeed. However, team also must acknowledge a negative impact of individual behaviors that can affect the team effort. And then you have to help them address the negative behavior as they arise. So these are um, things that you could teach your student um, to the team project, teach them about interpersonal skill and teamwork skill. 
Um, and then there's other thing too, right? So check in with your team and observing their dynamic important um, for you to detect and correct any issue. Um, so communication need to be clear, direct, respectfully in meeting. Um, and then um, consider maybe scheduling meeting with each team during office hour or you being present during team work meeting. Um, and also please keep in mind that team dynamic may vary based on the members background. So team from collective culture may be more cooperative than individualistic culture. Um, another thing to consider is gender typica typical dynamics so exhibit by women. So um, women tend to admit vulnerability more. It's also impact perception of their ability. Um, so maybe consider coaching female students to take ownership of their ideas, speak more confidently, and demand um, more technical and leadership role than just accepting the secretary role on a board of director, like I mentioned. So these practices can help students' success in team. Um, last time I presented this workshop, there were one engineering professor, and he shared that in his um, team project, he asked people to rotate the leadership role. And so the female student or the minority student know that it's coming. They're going to have to step up and take that leadership role at some point in the semester. And I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, so these are something to consider. Um, and then the last thing, a equitably assessed student team. So again, this tool is for classes that have a lot of students and they use a lot of teamwork, team project throughout the semester. Um, so um, thing to consider are um, provide time and guidance for team to examine how they're working together. So consider asking questions that allow your student to reflect on their own and their peer contribution to the team. Take the opportunity when students share with others to illustrate the kind of response that are, that are useful. Um, um, also consider allowing time for team to processing in class, debriefing after class, and discussing a potential issue in, with the whole class to prevent conflict and, and confusion later on. Um, peer evaluation can be useful to um, provide feedback to improve team interaction, why the teamwork is in progress, and also it can be used to measure individual accountability in student course grade. So I know many faculty who use team project, um, they love using peer evaluation. Um, so consider distributing peer evaluation at multiple points throughout the term so students can learn how to score the teammate and get used to sharing um, their rating with teammate. So we want them to improve, right? So we want to give them opportunity for improvement. So if we do a peer evaluation at multiple points during the semester, then they know what is the expectation and they have a chance to improve and earn more points um, instead of waiting toward the end. Um, collaboration is important, so group work shouldn't be avoided. However, group grade doesn't indicate whether individual students have mastered the learning objective or the standard. So to be fair and equitable, um, student grade um, should reflect their learning. So individual grade should always be assigned to group project. Um, so that was the of, um that I have to offer, I want to ask you some reflection question um, here. So how would these practices prepare you and your student for a team focused workplace? Um, develop high quality group assignment, mindfully and purposefully construct diverse team, um, embrace social attentiveness, or um, interpersonal skill, and then lastly, equitably assess student teams. So you don't have to answer all the, if you did want to pick on one or two and share, um, reflect back on what you hear today and how would you implement it into your, your class. I guess um, for me, um, this semester more than any, I've had to 
really be careful of assuming identities. Um, and so um, the, the um, especially with freshmen, and I don't know them, and there's so many of them, um, assuming anything about their identity is really, um, to me, very, I have to be very careful on that. So um, I could see maybe this would be a little bit easier to assign groups once you know the students more, or even there, as Brendan has said, there's some quagmires associated with that. Mm -hmm. um, so I like the random, um, or also the shuffle. <laughs> Um, so that seems less um, like the instructor has the finger on a student's success or not. Um, but yeah, so again, just maybe something that's very live and uh, raw in terms of my own um, interactions this semester is just a, a identities. Um, yeah. So the students seem to be very kind towards and very forgiving or it, um, just oblivious, like they don't care about other student identities. Um, whatever goes is whatever is it's fine um, and so I, I don't want to overstep um, the importance of identity because I don't I don't know that it holds the same in the current generation of students as it did for us so mm -hmm. uh, two different things there but yeah. all, all centers on identity yeah but that's a really good point so for the last I think the last probably almost decades, and I used to then increasingly become more diverse in terms of racial and ethnic city. So now, uh, last year, 70% of our students identify as student of color. Um, and this year, I think about 67% student identify as student of color. So if, Bill, I assume you take on the identity of a white person, white man. So now NIU is a majority minority institution. So being white or have the white identity make you a minority here. And so isn't that interesting? People don't say it out loud, but um, it's it's so good. That's the social perceptiveness that I'm talking about. You have awareness so that your social perceptiveness really good there and that's something that we want to teach our student too yeah I mean it's it's something that I'm certainly aware of that I walk in and I'm just another old white guy right it's <laughs> it's, it's horrible because that's what they first see and I've I got to break that first right because if you don't see me you can't hear me and if we're not speaking the same language then this is going to be a really rough semester um yeah. and so if you're not open to hearing me so the first thing I do is I joke about I'm an old white guy Right. And it, it immediately starts the semester that this is not going to be a typical class. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, and so yeah. to me, I've got to bring it center. I've got to bring yeah. it right up front. Um, it might make students a little bit awkward because this is not something that we talk about. Yeah. Right. It's not OK to talk about this in social circles, but we've I've got to get it out of the way mm -hmm. so that we can just talk about being human and then we can yeah. talk about the biology. So, yeah. And I'm glad you embrace that. Humor is one of the best way to break the ice. Right. And the stop a good relationship, but also like other identity, too. Like my husband is an old white guy, but he's a first generation um, graduate from college. And so I start to encourage him to embrace that identity because he went, I mean, he doing on Friday, he would eat a lot so that over the weekend back then when um the, the campus dining area closed, he basically starved and to eat cereal for Saturday and Sunday and wait until Monday to go back to the cafeteria and, and pie up on food. So I say these story is very critical. You you can tell your student, even though I'm white, I'm a man, but I'm first generation um, going to college. I My family were very poor. So anything you willing and comfortable sharing to make the human connection, like you say. Yeah. How about you, Brandon? Um, yeah, I, I just reflecting on the talks we've had tonight or during this, I, I really think, you know, it's a challenge that I'm going to, you know, look into for this undergrad class that I teach, you know, I only teach it once a year, but I, I'm, you know, just hearing both of you talk, I really think it would be beneficial for these students to get more comfortable being uncomfortable. Uh, I think, in, especially in group dynamics, I, um, yeah, I'm just really, I'm really thinking about how to purposefully, uh, you know, 
I, 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 Bill, I really like your idea of shuffling. Like, yeah, you can, you, you can come in and choose your groups for the first, you know, the first week or two, but you know, starting week three or four, um, I'm going to shuffle you guys. And like, that's just going to be the, a common practice that we do just so that you're getting some different experiences. You're getting used to working with people that you don't necessarily know, um, or that you don't know as well. Um, and that's, yeah, something that I, I tend to find right when we're working on these group, group assignments in class, there's always the, you know, one or two people who are driving the group, right. Who are, you know, getting, getting the material done. And, and you don't know if the, the two people who aren't talking as much, is it because they don't understand the material, right. And they're just letting the other two drive it home or, you know, are they just, you know, trying, trying to, to get it done. And so they can, so they can leave. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm really thinking about how to, um, yeah, I guess get them to be uncomfortable by, by, um, shuffling their groups every so often. Yeah. And thank you so much for being here. You know, just the fact that you care about teaching practices and trying to improve. And we have this conversation. I've learned so much from you, both of you. So I'm going to go and tweak this workshop and chain a little bit more. Because last time I only hear from the engineering professor. Now I hear from two other professors. So I'm going to work on that. And I think that's what we want our students to understand. Um, growth can be uncomfortable, but it's going to be rewarding. And that's how we learn and grow. So um, perfect time. I might put this presentation in a PDF file. I'm going to send you a follow-up email with the link to this recording as well as the um, PDF file of the, the slide so that if you need some resources, you can go back there. And um, enjoy the rest of your day. The weather is lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you for hosting us. All right. Bye.